Okay, so um, it's a pleasure today to have uh, Professor Michael Brenner from Harvard University um, here. Um, David Greer, maybe should have given this. David Greer was on his thesis committee, I think, that's right? I think that's true, yeah. At uh, Chicago, where uh, Michael has been working with Leo Kavanaugh. He then went to MIT, and he's been at Harvard since 2001. Um, so the area he works on is anything quantitative you can say about the world. So he's worked on things like uh, the aerodynamics of uh, whale spins. Um, if you take n spheres, how you can, how many different ways you can put them together. Um, if you have a certain set of proteins, how many things you can make from them. Um, all sorts of things like that. Anything quantitative you can do with nature or even sociology. Um, he's probably most famous for two things. One is busting the bubble of um, fusion by doing a real theory of solid luminescence, which got rid of the idea that you get fusion that way. And for <coughs> for creating a course at Harvard with Dave Waits, which is on science and cooking, which for many years has been the most popular course on campus. Uh, today's going to tell us about living stuff. Okay, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. So, um, I was thinking, I'm a bit embarrassed to be giving this talk here. I probably would be anyway, but for two reasons. So, the thing I'm going to talk about, I mean, so Ned Seaman, who I just met, he sort of showed you can make stickers that do all these amazing things. And then, I think the idea of this talk is Paul's, actually, that is certainly the title. I, I think I must have learned it from Paul. And um, this is just, so what I'm going to tell you is that sort of if you're a theorist and you don't have a lab and you really can't do anything and you're trying to think of something useful to do, then this is where you get to. So I, I'm a bit, you know, we'll see how this goes. So um, the, the talk I'm going to tell you, the work I'm going to tell you about was really done um, almost all um, with Zorana, who um, just moved to ESPCI. Um, and we've worked, we've had a wonderful collaboration for years with Vinny Manoharan, and he sort of was in the background of all things um, that we do. Okay, so um, so the question that I want to address, and I think that this is really Paul's, I don't actually know whose question this is, but I think I must have learned this question from you in some way, which is, it's a serious question, it's, uh, although, um, which is, what would it take to create a synthetic material with the properties of a living um, one? I mean, that is, if you were really going to do it, um, then what would it take to be able to do it? And if you sort of read the history books, there are um, sort of three things that, um, people tend to talk about in that spirit. The first is self-assembly, the, the ability to somehow spontaneously assemble things um, that are complicated. The second is self-replication. There's this, um, one, um, you know, the ability to replicate oneself. This sort of um, harkens back to Schrodinger and von Neumann, and I'll say a little bit about it in a little while. And the third is the idea of metabolism. And this sort of came, I think, was really brought to the front by Freeman Dyson, who, um, who talked about how one you know, what, what, the properties of metabolism, and I'll say a little bit about this now and much more about it later. And the question is, is what properties and interactions one must, must one have in a material um, for it to be able to exhibit these properties? Um, so, um, so, okay, so, um, so with respect to self-assembly, the sort of paradigmatic thing you're supposed to say is the way that human beings assemble things is different than biology. Biology has lots of different parts um, which assemble spontaneously into complicated structures. Um, there are microtubules, there are lots of pictures one can draw, there is the ribosome which is made out of lots of different proteins and RNA and the, um, and, the, and these have the ability to, to, um, to spontaneously assemble, presumably with high yield. And the question is really, you know, what does it take to be able to do this? So that's self-assembly. So self-replication, um, the, um, the sort of most famous discussion in physics departments is the book of Schrodinger on what is life that everyone here has presumably read, right? Do you guys read this? It's a good book, you should read it. But there's this other book actually, which I sort of like better, um, which is by v von Neumann, um, which, which you can get for free on the web, it's the, P a P the PDF of, and it's the last set of lectures that he gave, which is called The Theory of Self-Reproducing um, Automata, and in it he asked the question, what would it take to make a mathematical model which had the ability to replicate itself? And in this context he invented cellular automata, so he basically took a lattice of node points, and on each node he put 
a cellular automata, he determined that the cellular automata had to have, to have 29 states for this to work, and he then laboriously worked out the rules that one would need to program these automata such that the thing would basically start with a state and replicate itself. And the, the, the book is remarkable for the level of detail that is in it, including he has a whole chapter on the wires that you need to actually propagate information along the, uh, the automata, and he ended up concluding that it was actually within the laws of mathematics to be able to create a set of rules that replicated itself. So after that, that um, people like John Conway invented the game of life and things like this to show that you could do it much simply, more simply, and this is now sort of, it's so obviously true that no one even thinks about it anymore, but this is a remarkable book which um, has stimulated us in many ways. So, and then there's the idea of metabolism, and this um, basically, um, really, I guess I learned about from a, a, a very nice book that Freeman Dyson wrote called something like What is Life or The Origin of Life. I don't remember, it was in the early 80s. There was a paper that he wrote 10 years beforehand. And what Freeman argued was that you, know, you could talk about replication as being the essence of biology, but really he said biology is about metabolism. Namely, what you have to have are enzymes that basically have the property that they work cooperatively with each other to form more complex reactions than they could um, on their own. And he asks the question in this, in this book and in his paper that accompanies the book, what would it take to have a bunch of of enzymes that had this property. And he formulated what he called the garbage bag model. And the garbage bag model is a very beautiful idea. What he did was he said, imagine you have a bunch of random enzymes. And the deal is because they're random, what they do is they randomly catalyze random stuff. And so he points out that if you had that, if you had these random enzymes that were randomly catalyzing random stuff and you put them in a, like a, in a, in a bag, then of course, if you just you know, divided the bag at some rate, you would have a stable state because they were always just randomly creating random stuff. But this, he argued, is not life because you know, nothing was really, it was just all random stuff. So then he said, what if the enzymes sort of work together in some way? Can I basically demonstrate that there is a phase where the enzymes actually spontaneously work together to create complex reactions? And within the context of a very simple model, he delineated um, when this could happen. And he argued that this was really the essence of life. So, okay, so the goal of this talk is to, um, to try to ask the question of what would it take to make a material, a synthetic material that has these properties. Now, self-assembly and self-replication, so I, just to be sort of cut the thing, the reason I'm giving this talk here today is that I really wanted to tell Paul and Dave, who I will wake up at the appropriate time, and it is a test, <laughs> about the third part of this, because the, the, you know, the first two parts, you guys, you know, collectively are the experts in self-replication, like I have nothing to say. Self-assembly, I mean, Ned, I mean, I just, I'll tell you some things, but there's nothing really to say, but the end, the last part is a part that I'm sort of interested in at the moment, and you might decide it's nonsense, which would be good. I'm just trying to preempt, um, you know, our, our wasting more time. And, but that's really the, the, the crux of the talk. So, but I'm going to basically ask, I think the serious question that sort of underlies this entire area is, what would it take to make a synthetic material that does this? And I'd like to, before going into the substance of this talk, show you a quote from von Neumann from this book. Um, so this is, he says, um, you know, a complete view of automata can be obtained only by taking a broader view. One imagines automata which can modify objects similar to themselves or affect syntheses by picking up parts and putting them together or take synthesized entities apart. He says, draw up a list of unambiguously defined elementary parts. Imagine there's a pr practically infinite supply of these parts floating around in a large container. One can then imagine an automata functioning in the following manner. It is floating around in the medium. Its essential activity is to pick up the parts, put them together, um, and take them apart. And then he goes on to say this is an axiomatically simplified description of what an organism does. And I like this because he wrote this in the like, 1950s. I think this is basically what we're all trying to do. He even has the floating around in a large container, right? The whole bit, bit's all there. And he just calls them automata. But Really, that's what we're all trying to do, is build automata. So, and th now, of course, and I just want to say one thing about this, is that I, when I was a graduate student um, with Leo, there used to be lots of talks about cellular automata, and, and I hated them. I just despised them with a passion. And I just, and I found them offensive. And, um, and, and the reason was, was because, of course, if you were talking about cellular automata, I mean, John will remember, they were everywhere. We were always, I mean, I found them offensive, right? And the reason that I found them offensive was because, you know, like you, I mean, you make up what, whatever you want and you get out whatever you made up. And, and there just didn't seem to be any content. So the only way, and, and I mean, I, I, I pull von Neumann out of that critique simply because he was the one who really asked the questions. So for it to be interesting, you have to ask whether or not one can do this that respects the laws of physics, right? That is, how can one make these things while not violating them? And, and the things that I'm going to tell you about today have the feature that um, probably none of them can be done in the laboratory at the moment, um, but maybe someday they could. But I think in principle, at least, they, they don't violate the laws of physics. 
and, and, and that's what we're trying to do. And so um, at least this is the sort of interesting part of being a theorist in this field. So okay, so what I'm going to talk about are hypothetical material that I'm going to talk about, and this was sort of went back to work of Vinny um, a while ago, um, has to do with our material is made of clusters of colloidal spheres. So these are colloidal spheres that stick to each other. This is a picture from Vinny's lab of four particles in a tetrahedron that are um, going around. And these clusters are the automata that sort of underlie this talk. Um, and of course, by themselves, automata just stick, the, the spheres just stick to each other and you can't do anything interesting with them. I mean, at least within the context of this. Um, but um, so what one needs really to do something interesting are specific glues. And this is where NED comes in and the whole idea of using DNA, programming DNA as stickers. Um, and, um, and, but, the, but the point is, is that, and, and that of course you all, many of you know um, much better than I do, but the question that I want to ask is the following, is that, so if, if you wanted to create a material that spontaneously forms of a metabolism, how complex do the interactions have to be? So for example, you can make specific glues, you can make it so that two particles sp stick specifically to each other and they don't stick so well to anyone else, but that in itself is not enough to make something which self-replicates, for example. I mean, for example, in the experiments that Paul does here, the, you have to turn on and off light or something to make things come apart. So just having things that stick specifically is not enough. Um, so what the things that we're going to be imagining in today's talk, the things that I'm actually going to claim are, is that in order to make something that sort of resembles a metabolism to form spontaneously, at least in the theoretical material I will describe, what one needs are glues that are time dependent, that is the strengths have to change in a time dependent fashion. They have to either weaken in time monotonically or strengthen in time monotonically. To my knowledge, I'm not, I'm not sure that anyone to my knowledge has built these yet, but they're things that schemes have existed for at least a decade for how you might using this, you do this using things like strand displacement reactions in DNA. And the other thing one needs on spheres are constraints on particle valence, which um, people, in particular here, Yasna, who's not here, sort of figured out ways of doing this. And so there are little bits that you need. And in a sense, the, the substantive part of this talk, if there is one, is the question and, you know, given interactions, what can you do that's really different? So, okay, so here is the outline, and I'm still doing okay with time. So first I want to tell you, um, just very briefly review some old work that we did on colloidal sphere packings, which will be important for the part that I really want to tell you about. I'm then going to blow through self-assembly, um, which the students were telling me about. I, one of you... Um, should come and give that part of the talk. I'll tell you a little bit about self-replication, the work that we did, um, which is important for the last part, which is the thing that I actually really want to talk about, which is to talk about um, metabolisms. And, and I don't know if people ask questions here, but if you don't, then I'll feel very insecure. Um, um, and so I guess I haven't said anything yet, so there's no reason you have anything to say. OK, so there are two different um, clusters that are going to play an important role in this talk, and so I thought I would introduce you to them now. So one is the octahedron, and the other is a seven-particle <coughs> cluster that is both rigid and chiral. This turns out to be the only seven-particle cluster that is rigid and chiral, and, and these are the two things that play, that, that will figure prominently. Okay, so with respect to colloidal sphere packings, this is an experiment that Vinny did, um, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so. Basically what he did was he took um, colloidal particles that were interacting via depletion interaction and he put them in uh, little jars and he let them go. And they, of course, stuck to each other and they formed structures. And um, the question was if one could predict, um, assuming that these things were in equilibrium, what the structures are that could form. Now, in order to do that, what one has to do, there's sort of an algorithm for it, what one has to do is solve the statistical mechanical problem if it's in equilibrium. And that involves of course, computing the partition function. Now, the partition function for a cluster is sort of straightforward to calculate as long as the range of the interaction is short relative to the size of the particles. But what's not straightforward to, part to, um, to, to calculate is to figure out the set of all structures that are consistent with there being the number of particles that you have. And so, motivated by this, um, Natalie Arcus, who was a graduate student at the time, proved what um, I like to call Natalie's packing theorem, which was to enumerate the, um, all of the packings that there were up to as high of an N as she could get to. And we didn't actually know at the time what we were going to do with this. In fact, I remember walking through Paris with you telling Paul that we were doing this, and he was like, why the hell are you doing this? And I said, I have no idea. It just seems like a fun thing to do. But anyway, um, we did this, and so um, the, the, um, the, um, the, the, um, so it turns out that it's six particles. That's the first value of, of N where there are two different structures. There's the octahedron and there's a, a tetrahedral structure um, that emerges. Um, at seven, for seven particles, there are five different structures, one of which is chiral. That's this one. That's the one that I highlighted. For eight particles, there are 16 um, structures, 13, and three of them are chiral. Um, for nine, there are 77 structures, 50 and 27 that are chiral, and so on and so forth. Maybe you feel comfortable stopping asking questions. Yeah. 
Um, what do you mean by structures that are a lot, like, I mean, three parts are right. a lot. Too. Right, right, good. So, the, so I, I should have said this. So we were interested in enumerating the minimally rigid structures. So we asked, what are the structures for which there are at least 3n minus 6 contacts? So if you have n particles, there are 3n degrees of freedom. There are three um, translations, three rotations. There are 3n minus 6 internal. And we asked, how many have this? Now, if you have that list, you have the list of everything, of course, because you can just break bonds, and so you're done. So it's just combinatorial. And we did this because we wanted a dictionary upon which to work. We also wanted to understand Vinny's experiment. Miranda um, is now here, was a postdoc at Harvard, and she figured out a wonderful way to go. She, she has, to my knowledge, with the, the most comprehensive list that exists are, and the, the point of this is by 14 particles there are 872,000 different structures that obey these, this criterion. And, um, and, and the point is, is that, I mean, th this is a large number, these are large numbers, but there's a point, that there's a real sense in which for things like this we understand everything to the extent that we can literally design chemistry by going and checking every possible solution at a time to see if it works. Which is what, by the end of this talk, assuming I get there, what we're now trying to do with this stuff. Um, and um, so that's that. Okay, Vinny then did experiments, um, you know, where he measured for identical particles, um, you know, uh, interacting with the depletion interactions, the probabilities of getting the different structures. So this is the n equals six polytetrahedral structure, and this is the octahedral structure, and the octahedron occurred four percent of the time. Um, something that one could readily explain using sort of simple statistical mechanics, um, and um, so we did that seven particles. Um, so we did all of that. So, um, so, okay, so that's the sort of background on clusters. So now, then at that point, Zorana um, um, came and started as a postdoc, and she wrote a code. And I guess I'm going to, to pause on this point, because one of the questions in this field, it seems to me, is how one should, was, should be allowed to be a theorist, right? Because you see, the thing is, is that I'm going to make things up at some point. And the question is, if you're going to make things up, what are you allowed to make up? And I would argue you're allowed to make up things that are consistent with physics, because I'm only interested in making up theories of things that have a chance of being realized. So Zorana wrote this code, and the code originally was designed to basically reproduce, um, to emulate this, this experiment, which, exist, which existed, right? It was sort of n particles undergoing Brownian motion, and she, you know, this was sort of showing the flips between this, this sort of moment of inertia, the second moment of the, um, of the polyhedral and octahedral structure for six particles. And we sort of calibrated this code extensively against everything that we knew um, from the experiments. And so everything that I'm going to tell you in this talk, including the part that I actually want to tell you, um, at which I start doing things that can't be done in the lab, are used using this code. So basically what we do is we take this code, which actually works for interactions that are known, and then we say, Imagine that you could do this, what would happen? And the this, and we use the same code. You, you see what I mean? So that's the sense in which the arguments here, the, 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 it's, in case anyone at the end of the talk, I'm just preempting, wants to raise their hand and say, but nothing you said is real, that's totally correct. But it is also true that it was done with a code that except for certain chemical steps that can't yet be implemented, it might as well be real. Uh, so that's, that's at least my argument. You can choose to believe it or not. Okay, so, and we, we really showed that basically that this code um, quantitatively matches the experiments that we knew and the theory for the cases that we knew about. So, okay, that was colloidal sphere packings. So now self-assembly. So the first thing we did with this was to use this to study self-assembly. I'm going to say this very quickly. This was essentially our effort to do what Ned and colleagues have done so successfully with DNA, to do it with colloids, just to see, just to use it to ask questions. Um, and since we didn't actually have to do anything in the lab, we could make the computer do whatever the hell we wanted, so we could do things that were, um, that were more complicated than have been done experimentally, and in particular the question was, if you have a bunch of spheres which are colored, colored means they're coated with DNA strands, so they stick specifically to each other in some fashion, what could you build out of it? What were the limits to what you could build? And the, the way that we basically went about doing that, that is as follows, this will be important for the rest of the talk, and so I want to dwell on it, is that so you have a, a number of different building blocks which have different colors, that they have different interactions with each other. And imagine you wanted to use these building blocks to make a desired structure that looked like this. Then what you do is you make the adjacency matrix of this structure. So the adjacency matrix is the matrix that has a one on it. If one sticks to two, then you put a one, and otherwise you put a zero. So first you make the adjacency matrix of the structure that you would want to form. Then what you do is you basically make sure that the energies of interaction between the colors is such that, that, the, that the bonds that are, you want on the adjacency matrix are preferred. That, that's where you just make it so that they're preferred. And then, of course, the off-diagonal ones here are zero, but of course you all know they can't be zero because in reality, right, one of the things about DNA or any type of specific glue is there's always cross interactions with the things that you don't want. And to a, in a real sense, the fight that one is playing is, is you know, how, 
how well can one beat that? So, and, so using this, you could sort of, you know, in the computer, sort of show how you can improve yields of things that were bad. So for example, this is the octahedron, um, which if the particles are all identical, has 4% yield. And if you cover them in this way, so you have three colors, blue, green, and red, and this is the interaction matrix, and the deal is, is that blue, no color sticks to itself, but it sticks to the other two. So this is the adjacency matrix. I'm gonna be using this notation and what follows. Then you basically can improve the yield to be you know, larger than 90%. Um, and then the question is, is why is the number 90%? You know, I mean, why is it not 80% or 99%? And without spending a lot of time on it, we studied that problem and understood what the defect states were that were basically limiting yield in these systems. I mean, basically, for example, for the octahedron, if you design it like this, this is the ground state, but the, the point is, is that there are low-lying local minimum. In particular, if you flip these colors, remember green sticks to blue and red, but it doesn't stick to itself. But if you flip four and five here, then you can get a structure which has green next to green and blue next to blue. And this thing, you can only reorganize into that thing by breaking a bond, but the energy is lower because these things don't stick to each other. And these are the local minima. There are three of them for the octahedron because of symmetry that are competing with the ground state. And, and basically, this becomes a game of, of computing local minima. So there have been experiments on this, as you might expect. Um, but of course, one can build more complicated things. And we actually, this was the same summer that I was walking with Paul in Paris. There was, a muse there was an exhibit at the um, Palais, I can't speak French, Palais du Chaillot. Somebody here must speak French. You know what I mean? They had this exhibit, and on the first floor they had a, they had a museum exhibition of, of, to of architectural structures built with geomags, which I noticed that Paul has in his office. And they had, and I sort of went through, and one of them was this Big Ben thing. And so I took a picture and said to Zorana, we have to build Big Ben. And so we made that for years, that was our goal, to build Big Ben. It was totally ridiculous, as the students pointed out to me when we talked today. I completely agree, why would you want to do this? There's no reason, it was just, we wanted to show that you could build something. And so what we did, this is our Big Ben, and this is the adjacency matrix of our Big Ben. And um, what Zorana showed was that in fact, you know, using these rules, you can get the thing to assemble Big Ben. Um, and you don't really have to work very hard, and as long as, and the yield is actually pretty damn high. It's like, you know, this was for 69 particle Big Ben, the yield was about 60%, um, and this yield was determined by the defects in the system, and the, the yield starts to degrade substantially around 500 particles. And so, you know, using this sort of thing, you can build things without doing anything at all that are pretty big, um, as long as, of course, you can make the particles, and that's self-assembly. Okay, so, um, self-replication. Does anybody have anything to say? Still, I guess it's fine. I mean, you know, cloaky are good places to sleep, um, you know, if nothing else. I mean, so you, you, you could always use it as that. So, you know, then there's sort of self replication. And self replication, I mean, this is sort of one of the centers of self replication, and I'm sort of, sort of embarrassed, um, you know, to mention it here. But, you know, basically there are these, um, you know, there have been lots of efforts to sort of make self replicating structures. I think it's fair to say that the efforts that have been made experimentally t tend to use one dimensional templating. That is, you tend to sort of do something which mirrors the DNA copying mechanism in which you, you build a linear template and then you template um, on top of that. So, um, so Zorana and I got interested in the question of whether or not one could actually create something that self replicated clusters. Um, at the time, actually, we didn't know why we wanted to do that. Um, um, you know, because the, and, and, but, but I'm going to suggest a reason um, in a little bit. So, but namely, we're going to see that as clusters, as catalysts, if you're using the clusters to be catalysts, which is what I'm, then um, they, they, they tend to actually be more powerful than linear chains. I will comment on that later. And basically, we, what we asked ourselves, could we make a way to, um, to replicate an octahedron, to self-replicate an octahedron? Now, um, so I already told you about how to assemble um, an octahedron, namely the, one, the way one does it is to use this um, energy matrix. And, um, and, um, but what, what it turned out is, is that you can't actually self-replicate an octahedron by templating a structure on top of the octahedron. And the reason is, is very simple, it's just geometry. So you know, if you have a linear chain and then you, you bring in the pieces to replicate the chain, then of course they're geometrically compatible. So you can like form it and then it can come apart and you're good. But with the octahedron, you see, if you imagine putting a particle here, 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 and here. Like you can have the complementary blue particle, the complementary green particle, and the complementary red particle. The problem is, is you can't fold them to basically form the octahedral structure so that it'll come off. There's a geometrical constraint. And so to get around that, what we did was to sort of cheat. Um, and we introduced what we call the catalyst, but it was really just another structure. It was another structure. It was um, you know, purple and orange. 
And, and the, the deal was we designed a schema in which these two structures together could form um, something that self-replicated. And this was the self-replication cycle that we proposed. Um, I, I, the colors are absent on this. You, and just for ease of seeing, this is a, a, a red cluster and a blue cluster, but they have each of, the, each of these is labeled in the way that I said before. So what you do is you imagine these are in the bath, and from the bath, um, particles come on. These particles basically decorate both the octahedron and the dimer, making what we call a hairy octahedron and a hairy dimer. Um, then, if this, this movie works, I think, uh, right, oh no, wait, this, is this going to work? Oh yeah, here, this is a, so it's a hairy, a hairy um, octahedron. Isn't that good? Sorry. Um, sure. and, um, and, then, and then what you do is, but then the problem, of course, with this hairy octahedron is that, that if they fold, it forms this, which is not another octahedron. So what we do instead is we have the dimer come in, and if you had a situation where the dimer comes in, I'm like this with its two particles, and this contributes its two particles. You can see there are four particles, and then there's one on the top and then one on the bottom. And those two, if they basically stick to each other, can form an octahedron. Um, and, and that's basically how it works. And um, of course, when it forms the octahedron, you have to actually have some sort of a melting criteria. Now, the way that we did this in our um, paper was not to have an external drive like exists here. Uh, like, like you guys have, like you, you have the light which oscillates, which causes things to come apart. I mean, one could, of course, you know, imagine the same thing, that now the light comes in and once enough bonds form between these things, then it melts these things, they come off, and then it has to refold to make an octahedron. Uh, we, we chose not to do that because we wanted there to be local, we, we wanted there to be a local criterion that determined when things would melt, which is actually critical for the part of the talk that I'm gonna, that, that is the part that I actually wanted to tell you um, today. Um, so, so um, but, but then basically you, you need to make sure when the thing melts though, you see because it has to fold into a structure, when it melts it's not a rigid structure, it's flexible. This basically has a little lid on which has to close. And you have to be sure that it doesn't, um, that when it melts it doesn't mess up the, um, the, um, the octahedron and it doesn't fold into something else. And that's the cycle. So, um, so this is the cycle in all of its detail. It's actually a, it's two cycles that are coupled because every particle has to have a complementary particle, right, that binds to it from the bath. And, um, and, and so there, there's sort of two, so it's, 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 it's two coupled cycles that, that form octahedra and dimers and their complement um, every time. And this is the interaction, just to sort of show you the complexity of this, there are 10 different particles. This would, if you ever want to grow octahedra in the lab, you'd never do it this way. This is totally dumb, because this requires 10 different particles, um, um, which have an interaction energy matrix that is as written there. And, but, but if you take this um, and, and, you then, um, in, and you then put it in a computer, then it will work. Now, the one thing I have to tell you that I want to basically mention is that the, the one sort of tricky bit is you have to talk about melting. You have to do something to say when it's going to melt. And so in the experiments here, the melting happens through an external drive, but here it's going to happen locally. And the way that we implement melting is by something, uh, is by something that I'd like you to imagine is a time-dependent glue. So namely, imagine that these particles start coming onto the structure and they start forming, but at some time, the, the, the bonds that are holding them to the thing that is being templated weaken and it actually comes off. So if you let it wait, so depending on how long that time is, that will control um, how many particles tend to accumulate onto it before it comes off. And by doing that, one can sort of tune basically the number of contacts that are formed before the thing actually melts. One has to be able to construct a glue for which one can control the time that it stays, that, that, that the things stay together. Um, Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you guys use this to such great effect. It's just that we, we I mean, we, at the time we had it in our heads, we wanted to do something intrinsic, right? We wanted there to be an intrinsic way of doing it. And you'll see why, because I guess what I would say, just to, to get to the, is that for the next part of this talk, when I sort of talk about generating metabolisms, right? That is, if, if, if the melting happened from an external thing, you'd never be able to do what I'm about to show you. So I, I, mean, I claim you can do more if, if, you, can, if you can control it locally, but I, I haven't yet. Um, but you just have to. But, but the clock inside your glue yeah. works with dependence or independently of what happens in your self assembly. Oh, it should be independent. So basically, the way, the, the way that it has to work is that you bind, and then once you bind, you stay bound for some amount of time. So therefore, this glue works independently of this. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's glue. So there's a, there's a cycle. There's a glue cycle that says these two stick, and you stick for 10 seconds. 
Now, you, if you tune the concentrations right within those 10 seconds, you know, you might set it up so that you get, on average, of course, right, there are going to be errors, but on average you get enough particles bound so that when it comes apart, you know, it will fold into an octahedron. Right, and whether or not, so there are parameters you have to play with. So this is the thing, right? There's a huge parameter space here, but what I'm trying to communicate is that if you want to be able to do what I'm going to show you in a minute, you need to basically have a parameter, which is sort of how long you stay bound. And, and then you're going to have to be very careful about parameter space. I mean, it's, um, but, but that's what you have to do. And the thing is, is that the longer the time is, so the longer you let it stay bound, so then the more bonds, NC is the number of bonds that are formed before it melts, the more will form, and they will, of course, take longer for things to form, but when it forms, it'll form more fully, so there will be less errors. If you make that time very short, then you might never form um, octahedra um, if you want. And I mean, in fact, right, for, for octahedra, right, you, you start asking the following question. So this was the structure that I showed you in the diagram, right? It was the thing with the lid. This is missing two bonds. So an octahedron has 12 bonds. This thing has 10 bonds. If you ask for structures with nine bonds, you can enumerate all structures with nine bonds, and these are them all. And the question is, is which of these, if you let it go, given the attraction rules, actually fold into octahedra as opposed to something else? And it just so happens that for this, um, all of them, so we actually, so almost all of them do. So we actually started creating folding landscapes of, 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 these, of these sort of nets that come together when the thing partially folds. And you then basically have to ask what fraction go into the correct structure. This has 12 bonds. This is the local minimum. This is the other thing that can happen to you. You can get stuck there. And it just turns out that for this, most paths actually lead to the correct structure if you form nine bonds. And so that sort of tells you how you have to tune your glue, right, if you want to make it work. And so to test this, we, we did a, um, so I wrote one-tenth of the structures don't fold correctly for this. So to test this, we did simulations using the code that I described. The code started with, had 512 collagen, and it was in a periodic box. It started with one octahedron and one catalyst. And um, then um, Zorana just let it go, and the number of octahedral clusters grow, grows um, exponentially with time. I have a movie here, and you're just going to see octahedra proliferating. The, the, one of them is just stuck in the middle so that it doesn't, everything doesn't fly off. But, you know, you see things come in, and then, and then uh, an octahedron should form. Yeah, see there, an octahedron form, and, and goes away. And that's, you know, sort of a, an example of a, of a thing. Okay, questions about that? Is this glue, once you condition, is it still an equilibrium system? No, the glue is not. Okay, so wait, wait. So if you want to self-replicate, you have to pay. There has to be energy consumed. I, the, and the glue requires energy, therefore, in order to do it. And I don't know that this is a theorem, but it must be. Somebody must be able to tell me this is a theorem. That is, if you, so the, if you have a bond that weakens in time, um, or actually you could have a bond that strengthens the time. You need to pay for that. I mean, the schemes that every scheme, I mean, we actually have been in the business of trying to invent schemes because we would like to basically compute, right, to actually compute the DNA kinetics to show, right, what the range of parameters for the time scales you can actually make are. But, the, um, but every scheme that exists, and there are some in the literature that were, that was made by, I'm going to forget who, there was a, in the, in the DNA nanotechnology literature, there's at least one paper from a decade ago that sort of wrote down a scheme for how you would get time-dependent glue with strand displacement reactions. And all of them require energy, and the energy comes from basically strands that are in the bath that are helping to displace the, the interaction. And I think that this must be a, a theorem. I told a postdoc who's at Harvard now that it must be a theorem and he should prove it and then compute the bound on how much energy should be required so that to, to get a particular time scale, because I think that would be a nice thing to know for this, but anyway, I, it, it's got to be, that's where the energy is stored. So um, in what I'm about to show you, which is, I think, an example of a self-generated self metabolism using something that's just a small generalization of what I just said, I mean, the energy is paid because you're dumping stuff in the bath to make the time-dependent glue form. And so you're going to have to feed your material in that way. Other questions? Okay, so this, Dave, this is the part you're supposed to wake up for. This is the part, you might not like it, you can fall back asleep, but at least I woke you up at the party. It's fine if you fall back asleep. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so let's talk about catalysts. So, um, I mean, of course, this idea, I mean, what I just told you about was, you know, taking an octahedron and templating a structure which became another octahedron. In general, you can generalize the scheme. You can take a structure, for example, this one, and you can use it to catalyze the formation of a new structure. You do that by taking the structure, this is the chiral um, N equals 7 cluster, and you allow it to bond the things that are complementary to it, right? And then those things stick to each other in a way that inherit the bonding rules that exist for the particles that are already there. And then if you have time-dependent glue, depending on what you set the time scale to be, when it comes off, you'll have some 
thing which can fold back into the structure that one wants. And so we decided, we started, we decided we just wanted to make a catalyst just for the hell of it. And we decided that um, we should invent the simplest structure that could self-catalyze an octahedron. I mean, why not? Right? I mean, so I just told you an octahedron can't catalyze an octahedron because of this flexibility problem. So you might then ask, is there a seven particle cluster that can, you know, catalyze an octahedron? And since we have a list of all the clusters, we can just go through and check. And it turns out this is the only cluster, there is a cluster of seven particles that can catalyze an octahedron. And it is this one. And the, the octahedron is the smallest non-trivial structure to catalyze because it has six particles and everything with less than six particles is only a unique solution. So there's no reason to even bother doing it. So here's the catalytic cycle for templating of an octahedron. So this is what you do. You have particles from the bath. They, um, they bind to these things in this way. Um, you'll notice, there's, you're gonna, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. There's one funny thing you have to acquire, which is that this red particle in the middle it has to bind to two complementary particles, not just one, for this to work, and I will show you why. Um, and then, you know, if you let it go, then, you know, it, 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 you form this structure, and this structure forms uniquely into an octahedron. So this is an example of a scheme that basically catalyzes um, an octahedron. Um, and, but, and there's this nice fact, which is that this thing can only form into an octahedron, given the bonding rules. So we discovered this by, I mean, this sort of gets back to this thing of this sort of horrible enumeration that we spent time doing, um, which is that, the, um, is that we, because we know all of the rigid structures, we know all of the unfolded structures, and that means we know everything about the system. Now, you might not want to, right? But, but it is an unusual system for that reason, because you can enumerate everything, and you can then combinatorially check, right, what, what can happen and design systems so that only those things can happen. And, um, and that was important for what I just described because you need to make sure that the unfolded template that comes off of the, the structure that's catalyzing will only fold into the thing that you want. Otherwise, you know, you're accumulating crap. Okay, so let me sort of explain how this works. So this is the energy matrix of the octahedron. I already told you this is the adjacency matrix. So if the octahedron, of course, has six particles in it. So there are, if you were doing the particle by particle matrix, there are two blues, two reds, and two greens. That's the matrix. It's this nice symmetric matrix. So, um, so this is the, the energy matrix. Um, this is the adjacency matrix, or the energy matrix, of the um, n equals 7 chiral cluster. You see it? And so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at this and find an octahedron. That's what you have to do. You have to find an octahedron in it. So you look at this, and you say, ah, you see, there's these squares. See that? But, and that's almost good enough, but you need three of them for this to work. There are only two squares, so you have to find another square. Now, to find another square, you have to find a particle which, which binds to both of these, to all four of those, but doesn't bind to itself. And of the particles that are left, other than two, three, four, and five, six doesn't satisfy it, one doesn't satisfy it, but seven satisfy it. It binds to these guys, but not to itself. But the problem is you only have one of them. So that means you now have to introduce a binding rule which says that now I'm going to allow two of those. So two sevens. And then if you do that, now we have an octahedron. So we've just formed a scheme to template an octahedron. But something important has happened. And sorry, this is, I know this is technical and it's supposed to be a broad talk and I apologize. But this is what has to happen. You have to choose, the only way to make this work is if one of the particles binds, in the binding rule, it binds to more than one particle. Note that to make this work in the lab, I should say, you have to actually enforce the number of particles that bind, which is something that, at least in my head, Yasna figured out how to do. I mean, at least one way to figure out how to do. So this can be done. You're allowed to basically enforce the number of things you bind to. And this, for this, you have to bind to one more than what you have. But this thing has to bind to two more than what you have. And then that's what you get. So we, um, you know, having figured out this, this thing, Zorana sort of delightfully, you know, I mean, this is, you know, said, okay, now I'm going to simulate it because we have our code. And so she simulated it. And um, this is what happened. I mean, so here it is. That's the thing. That's, it, this is a, a simulation just like the previous one. And, um, and, you know, you see it's like an octahedron factory. Do you see this? What? It's an octahedron factory. See them? It's, producing, it, it's stuck in the middle so it doesn't float off because there's Brownian motion. But it's an octahedron factory. So you're very, very happy. You think, oh, that's so great. We made an octahedron factory. Totally useless. But anyway, um, it's an octahedron factory. So, but then actually, and actually, these are just snapshots, right, of how it works. I mean, it's sort of, right, you, you know, it's sort of what I said. You start templating things. Once you template enough, the glue melts, it comes off, and then you end up with an octahedron. But. The octahedron is chiral. The octahedron is not chiral. 
The original structure was chiral. Octahedron. Uh, octahedron can't be chiral. Octahedron is just a octahedron. Yeah, right. but the original it was chiral. Was chiral. And it just happens. We only know this. So I don't know that chirality is important. I was using that as a descriptor. So you see, what we do is we go through this little exercise that I just showed you. So I should say this little exercise, this exercise I just showed you of how to find, how to template. Because we know every cluster of seven particles, we simply take every one and ask, does there exist a solution for templating, which allows an octahedron, and it turns out this is the only one. For eight particles, there are many more solutions, many, many more. There are many solutions for eight particles, but you can just sort of ask, can I template this structure out of this one? And we did that, and we found that you could do it as long as you allow one of the particles to have valence too. Um, and I should also say, because this is important for what follows, that when we kept looking for things to catalyze octahedra for bigger clusters, like eight particle or nine particle, it was always the case that the only way to do it was to have one particle with valence two. You could never catalyze an octahedron, for a reason that I don't really understand, um, without having this thing, that one of the particles stick to two other particles. Okay, so, um, you know, and then you can make this plot that shows you the octahedron, that shows you the number growing with time, and you can feel very happy. Okay, but then you ask, okay, that's very nice, so that showed you the octahedron coming off, but if you look more carefully at your simulation, what you might worry about is the following thing, is that, so the thing, we designed it to make octahedron, we very carefully constructed it in that way, but did we, in making those rules, make it so that it could make other things? I mean, because, you know, there was no, I mean, nowhere in what I said did it show that it couldn't, could only make octahedra. I just said it could make octahedra. Maybe, you know, with this time scale of the time-dependent glue, you know, it, it could make other things. And it turns out that actually, if you look very carefully at the code, it can make a lot of crap. And so here, let me just show you. These are snapshots from the code that show you other crap. There's just all, you can't quite tell in this. I'll show you a picture of more detail. This thing, it produces octahedra, but it also produces all of these other crap. And of course, once you produce crap, then it's bad, because it the crap produces more crap. Right, you see what I mean? And then you just end up with a sea of crap. <laughs> I guess you're not supposed to say that. I'm being taped. Shoot, I knew I shouldn't have agreed to be taped. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so now, mathematically, you can ask. I mean, we're supposed to be mathematicians or something. You can ask, you know, what crap can I produce? So this is a well-posed problem. So what you do is you say, okay, so we have this matrix that we designed, and we have the complementary matrix. Um, and then you simply ask, given these clusters, and given the fact that the seventh particle is allowed to have valence too, please enumerate all structures that can be formed. Because we have a list of all structures, so we can just go through and check every damn one of them, you know, up to n equals 14, because Miranda made this list, to see what, you act, what is logically possible given the constraints that we've put down. And this actually was a good reason, this is where I would offer to Paul now, like five years, ten years later, as a reasonable reason to make that list in the first place, is that now we can do this. We can say everything that can happen logically. And it turns out, and this is sort of interesting, that with those rules, you can only make a hundred different clusters. The largest cluster you can make with those rules has size 12. You can't make any cluster with more than 12 particles. Um, there are 176 different colorings that make these 100 clusters. Some have multiple colorings. And these are the pictures of the things you can make. The gray ones are the ones which have valence 2. Um, you know, which, um, and the other ones all have valence 1. And, um, and, and of these 100 clusters, everybody can't be templated by the thing we started out with. Right? It's not, you're not, but, but they can all be, but they're all logically possible. So then you say, well, what can be templated and what we ha comes out with? And so this is sort of a summary of a short time simulation. So this was the, this was the, um, the chiral cluster. These are octahedra, the one stars, those are the things we're supposed to be proud of. This thing, look at that, it made a seven particle, you know, um, pentagonal bipyramid. Damn. And then the damn seven particle pentagonal bipyramid made those two things. And then those, these are actually not even rigid. These are like not rigid, floppy things. And now like this beautiful paper we were writing about how we were going to, because uh, we can only write papers because we can't make anything actually, right? I mean, it was all just in the computer about how we were going to self-replicate octahedra. Well, I mean, in, in reality, you know, we just had a computer with a bunch of crap in it. You, you see what I mean? Okay. So, does it, okay. Okay, so but then what you can do is you can be an optimist and you can say, well, look, so we, I've told you there are only a hundred different clusters that were actually programmed by the program that I made. The program that I made was designed to template an octahedron, but anyway, it turned out that it templated, it gave a set of interactions between particles that gave a hundred different clusters. Now, of the possible set of clusters, that's a small set of them. And the other thing I know about those hundred clusters is that every one of them can template other clusters. Um, and um, so I can ask which of the clusters that I've made can 
template the other clusters. The clusters that the particles that are in the clusters in there that can temp blah. The clusters that can be templated by a given cluster have to live within our set because we enumerated everything that lived in our set. And so you can then start making these graphs. You see, of, of basically there's a graph. So these are all the seven particle clusters that can be made um, out of these particles. And there is a line with an arrow from one to the other if the, the said cluster can be templated by another cluster. So you see what I mean? So you have these things. So that there's like, if, if you can template you, then we draw a line. So then, you know, because we can enumerate everything, which seems utterly ridiculous, but anyway, then, you know, you can sort of make the graph of all the clusters. And that's it. Isn't that great? You're supposed to laugh. Um, it looks like a mess. But, but okay, but what actually, but then you sort of ask yourself, but that's all fine and dandy, but what actually happens if you were to put this in a jar? and really let this go. Like, let's just be serious for a minute. What actually happens? Now, we can't do the simulation because the, it's just too expensive to actually let it go, but, but there is something structural that we know, just purely at a moral level, um, about this. By the way, the largest cluster, I, I was wrong actually, it was not 12 particles, it was 11 particles, and this is the, the thing, this is the graph that includes that cluster in the middle. Um, yeah, I guess I'll say this now. Actually, no, let me go forward. So what actually happens? So what actually happens is the following, is that, so I have a P. P is, the prob is a vector of probabilities, is a vector of length 100. Um, the first one is the probability, the, the, concept, the probability of making the first cluster, the second cluster, the third cluster, right, by this templating reaction. And M is the matrix of connections. That's what I just showed you. It's the matrix of connections. Of course, that matrix of connections, you have to include the transition probabilities. That is, what is the rate of catalyzing, you know, cluster 50 from cluster 30. But that actually just, you know, it, the, the rates are diffusion limited and it, it you know, it's it, it basically, I mean, you just have to put in the rates. And we then basically, the evolution of everything that's going to happen just comes from this. This is just chemical kinetics on those clusters. And so you just ask yourself, if I have this thing and we know the structure of M, I mean, we can basically assume a rate model. That is, we can assume, for example, that, you know, um, that, 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 you know, I mean, we can assume that certain rates are dominant or whatever. Um, and then you can just solve this equation to find out what happens. And what happens, of course, is there's the fastest growing mode. I mean, that, that's what happens. I mean, you, you do this, you have this thing, like there's all this crap, it's true, but there's going to be a fastest growing mode. And the modes, it turns out, are catalytic cycles. Because this actually has within it cycles. I mean, you can actually, and these are just simple cycles. Right? I mean, so this is a cycle, you know, where basically this guy can make this guy, which can make this guy, which can make this guy, and it's a loop. It costs energy to go around the loop because the melting reactions take cycles. The, the, the existence of these cycles requires there to be one, at, at least one particle in the bat in this thing, which is the gray one, which can have valence too. Otherwise, you can't template and make this work, but, but it does. And, and in fact, there are just tons of cycles everywhere and out this, you, you can give this graph to Mathematica and it will count the number of cycles that you have um, for you, it just counts them and so you know there are 8,000 cycles of five and you then, you know, given a model of kinetics, one of them will win and there's a fastest growing mode and so these are eigenvalues, this is for some model of kinetics, it doesn't really matter what it is, you just have to use the one that corresponds to the kinetics that you're using in your experiment. There's one eigenvalue which is the fastest growing mode and that eigenvalue is a cycle. And this is the cycle that comes out of that one. And so what I guess I think is interesting about this, and I'm almost done, is that this sort of shows, I mean, this is really, I think, an explicit realization of what Dyson was talking about in the system with interactions. Namely, if you want to get something where instead of just self-replicating one thing, you self-replicate a whole loop, which will just grow exponentially, which I don't know what you would do with this, actually. I don't know why you would want to do this, but it seems interesting. Maybe you're not interested. It seems interesting. Then, then all, then basically the, 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 the game seems to be that if you have templating reactions with clusters as catalysts, time pen and clue controlling the number of bonds that form on average before the thing comes apart. And then there has to be some slight flexibility with how reactions can occur, which seems to be intrinsic because if we just ask the question of how does one template an octahedron, then you know, one, one immediately ended up with a particle with valence 2, which was enough flexibility in the system to allow this to happen generically. And so, I mean, we've sort of worked this out for a couple of examples like this, not many, but just a couple of clusters with templating reactions, and there are always cycles. And, and so that's what I wanted to, to tell you. So, okay, so um, just to summarize, so the question of what would it take to make a synthetic material with the property of a living one, so the question is sort of, well, what do you mean by a living one? And if one 
defines living as self-assembly, replication, and metabolism, then it seems that we are getting closer to be able to realize this um, in, the, in the laboratory. It's, it's not actually clear what you would do with this, but in case you're feeling critical, it's not clear that it wouldn't be useful. So, um, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. And it does seem to be a bit different. Um, so, um, and, and specifically, in order to make the code work that we ran to get this out, what one needs are specific glues, um, namely something like DNA complementarity, some sort of interaction that leads to specificity. One needs time-dependent interactions. One needs to be able to control the time scales of the interaction. And, and one would really like to be able to control them at will, actually. I, I, th this is not totally out of the... I mean, I'd like to be able to tune that number as much as I want. It's actually not clear how much, at least to me, one can tune the number, except there are, for example, beautiful, um, beautiful work by Jonathan Doy's group in Oxford that shows that by putting mismatches in strain displacement reactions, you can slow them down enormously. And so there seems to be room here to basically um, do it. And then there's control of particle valence, which Jasna um, showed you could do experimentally, and Dan Frankel has done nice theory on. And so it seems like it's sort of getting close. And, um, yeah, so, and so I guess that's really all I had to say. Um, so, I mean, I should also say, I mean, particle-based materials are just one example of how this type of thing could be created. I mean, if you could figure out how to do this, you might be able to do it with other things, too. Of course, there's no reason as of yet to do this with... Well, I shouldn't say that. I, I, this would be totally cool. Like, if you had something, like, imagine we had this magic stuff, you know? And basically, the magic stuff, it was actually doing something. You know, you were pouring in colloids and it was spitting something out. You would pour other stuff in and other stuff would come out. So it was actually, it did things. And, you know, you took some of the magic stuff out and it grew back, you know. You, you know, I don't know. It, 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 maybe there's something good with this. So, um, anyway, that's all I have to say. The, the last thing I want to say, and this is something that, that, all, that the audience, Paul and Dave, and you guys know very well, is, I mean, there's also, of course, the issue of motion, which is interesting. And, um, and, the, um, and the, there seems to be a lot of opportunity with that, too. There just seems to be, there seems to be a field where, I mean, you can just invent things. I don't know if that's good. Anyway, OK, so I want to um, end. I'm done. So this was the work that I told you about. Basically, all of the parts were done by Zorana. But this was sort of a research program that really started and is continuing with Vinny um, and um, was inspired by Vinny's experiments, as well as the experiments here. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. your time dependent glue. Yeah, yeah. Suppose that uh, I want to produce B from A and this requires glue with certain time dependence. Then yeah. I want to produce C from B that requires a different glue. No. And then to construct the cycle no, no. I have to do something. No, 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 but, but okay, so let me be very clear. So in the templating reactions I described, um, there were um, there are two different steps. One is that the particles have to attach from the bath. They attach specifically because they're, they're sort of DNA type reactions. I would like those to weaken in time monotonically with some time scale. Every part of the thing, which is one time scale. Well, I mean, if you wanted to do more, you could, but what, what was required in this code was one time scale. There is a time scale, right, which they all weaken by. So you need to produce these, to, you know, it's not enough to just produce complementary DNAs. What I need you to produce for me are DNAs or, or some sort of specific glues, which also, because of binding of other things like other DNAs in the bath, have the property that it will weaken monotonically in time. So that's the first type of glue. The second type of glue is I also would like, I didn't say this explicitly, that, the, that the, these particles that are attaching to the thing that is being templated, they of course bond to each other. And I would like it if you could make those bonds strengthen in time. I would like those bonds, everything, you know, the thing, the, the, the cluster that's being, I'd like them to strengthen in time because I don't ever want them to break. I, I want those to be there forever. So I'd like those to strengthen. They can all strengthen with the same time scale. I don't really mind. I just need to make sure they're strengthening with the time scale that is fast enough that the damn thing doesn't fall apart, given all the work that I just did to put it together. So I only require two time scales. Every interaction in the system that I described, instead of just being complementary, I need it to be complementary and time dependent, but there are only two different classes of time dependence that are needed. There's either monotone weakening or monotone strengthening. And there are, as I said, and I can show you afterwards if you are interested, I mean, there are, and you probably know more of them, there are um, schemes with strand displacement in reactions which will produce, in principle, both of these. So it's not out of the question, right? The thing that I don't know is 
whether is how much flexibility one has with this to change the time scale. And that's clearly going to be important. This, this thing that I'm describing will only work if you tune the thing correctly. Because if you, if you, for example, melt too fast, then you know, you're not going to form large enough clusters. But if you melt too slowly, right, you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, you, there's, a time, there's a parameter space. But this is what I find. I mean, just for me, the, the, the great challenge of this business is that there's such a large parameter space of things you could create. And our challenge I would, is to figure out which parts of it have things in it that are interesting, right? You know, that do things that are interesting. And it might be small, but you know, that's what we're supposed to do. So that's, that's, what I'm, that's what we're trying. Did that answer the? I think I still have some questions about it, but, but, but it's getting too, too specific and too technical. Probably other people should ask. OK, John? So is doing this in two dimensions better or worse? Right. So, um, so is doing this in two dimensions better or worse? So, um, I mean, of course, you know, um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, in two dimensions, you know, you, well, I mean, you know, that's simpler. There aren't as many things. It's easier to see. So Vinny um, um, with Miranda Holmes, who's here, and Becca, um, a graduate student of Vinny, um, made a two-dimensional system for clusters, right, that they that was sort of worked out for depletion interactions that one could generalize to, you know, put on time-dependent or specific glues. And that's one of the things that, you know, we've been talking about. I, I mean, so, I mean, you could do it that way. But, I mean, but part of the question here is, I'm not actually sure what the question is, actually, in the following sense, that I somehow have this idea, I mean, I think this is sort of goes back to Paul and Dave and people in this room, it's not me, and you too probably, actually, everybody. And this, I mean, what is it that you actually want to make with this stuff, right? So it seems evident that you can make things with this stuff that you couldn't make with other stuff, right? And, but what is it that we want to make? Like, so if we make things where there's it's a material which you're feeding it and it's metabolizing things and it has some cycle and so it can do things, that's different than at least what I was taught you can make with plastic spheres, right? But what do you want to make? And at some level, it's got to come back to that. So I think, well, it would be interesting to realize it in two dimensions in the lab. I'm not sure that's the most important question, but I don't really know. Right, so we, okay, so what, so what we know is given for up to 14 particles, um, if you give, the, if you tell us the adjacency matrix for up to 14 particles, we can tell you the structure. That is a non-trivial step. No, that's a non-trivial step. We can tell you all the structures. So therefore, since we can tell you all the structures, then at least if you're patient, you can compute the equilibrium probabilities of those, uh, of the structures. And we sort of know heuristics that, that work pretty well for how to do that. Um, that's what we can do. Um, for self-assembly, for yield, at this point, we know how to estimate the yield without running the simulation. I mean, it, it's not totally trivial, but we, you can do it with, you know, a piece of paper and pencil is, is too simplistic. What you actually have to do is take the structure, and then you have to find all of the, the low-lying local minima of that structure. So you have to enumerate them. That's something that's algorithmic. I mean, you couldn't, you can do it with a computer, right? You can write a program that will do that. Once you know that, you can compute for each of those structures what the contribution to the partition function is, and you can predict the yield. And, um, the time scales, you know, there are things that can be done. There are things that we know, I mean, but for anything of the level of complexity of the stuff at the end, I mean, you, I mean. So you told me the mean to pay attention to the octahedron and the chiral yeah. seven structure. Yeah. What we ended up with is this chiral seven structure as part of this huge catalyst. Yeah, like, made all this crap, yeah. Right, but it also proves octagon, octahedron, right? Yeah, it does, yeah, it does. So if you start out with this thing, yeah. and it's running through the cycle, and yeah. part of the cycle is this octagon. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready to end up with, with octahedra? With octahedra? Yeah. So whether or not you end up with octahedra, in fact, what you end up with depends on what time scale you choose for the specific glues. Because imagine that I have, imagine that I have, and this gets back to Alexander's question, I have some time scale of the things to melt. Now, the, that time scale is setting how many particles, in a, uh, when they come off, how many tend to be stuck together. I mean, you've set that with that time scale. There's the diffusion time of how long it takes for them to stick. Then that time scale is how long you've got. So, you know, I told you the biggest cluster was 11. I got it wrong, it was 11. So on the 11 particle thing, you can template, you know, 
you know, say 10 particle things. Well, whether or not you will depends on whether or not you chose that glue time scale to be long enough so that you will actually tend to template 10 particle things. If you do, you're not going to have very many octahedra at all because the 10 particle thing will make all these other things and then, you know, you're just going to have all this crap. On the other hand, if you chose the time scale to be shorter so that it was short enough to basically just allow for the octahedron to form and not allow some of the other stuff, then you would bias the distribution towards octahedron and you'd be more likely to have them in your bath. However, you will have lots of other crap too. There's no way to avoid the fact that if you do this, you're going to end up with lots of crap and you're going to end up with some fastest growing mode which is going to be cyclic, which is what's going to come out. And so, I mean, on one hand, you could take that as a failure, that is, we failed to produce a scheme that um, catalyzed only, you know, an octahedron pooper, because the octahedron pooper, using your language, also pooped out all of these other things. But the flip side of it is, is we self-generated a metabolic cycle. And if I were to tell you, I mean, if you read Dyson's thing, I mean, the, the, the question of whether it's actually possible you know, to without doing enormous tuning to get an exponentially growing cycle, I guess I, it was sort of unclear. Now, of course, this has the feature that you can't choose what cycle you get out, right? Well, I mean, you, tune the glue time, that, that's, you can yeah. by tuning the glue time, you will get different cycles. But if you want to make, you know, the, the you know the, the the Rubisco, the dark reaction cycle for, you know, you know, making glucose out of carbon dioxide. If you want to make that, you can't get specifically that. I mean, using the set of interactions, but you'll get something out. Which you might have to get specifically that. Yeah, yeah, no, it might not be a bad thing, but I think, I guess that's where, yeah. What, what, what Zinn Dyson's work yeah. is actually, this is the first one. Yeah. You essentially have a system which self-replicates. It doesn't really self-replicate itself. We call it a metabolism. Yeah. And he said from that, essentially, you evolve something which carried the information and started making things precisely. Well, that's essentially his, his idea of the origin of life. First, you have this metabolism, yeah. which is essentially de demonstrated, but from that would come something that would re replicate things like DNA much more exactly. You carry the information on. You mean see anything like that? You mean, but how would you know? So I, know how, I don't know how to look. In other words, you, you would see, I mean, in, his, in his picture, yeah. initially, you usually have lots of interaction catalyze each other, yeah. you get reinforcement of certain catalysts. Yeah. Okay? And from that, from this big cycle, you essentially go to a, a, a much more precise fixed set where you have something that carries the information from one to the other. Yeah. And that's sort of what, what you're asking, what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so I guess. This, is, this was his first step, which is a nice yeah. first step. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I guess, so what you would say is, is that one would need the cycle that came out, whatever it was, I mean, say it was this one, say it was that one, right? right? One would start to take over. Well, no, but these cycles, though, have the feature that they, they can't, everybody's going to take over, all of them. It's going to, there's, there's exponential growth of the dominant cycle. So you end up with a C of the dominant cycle because the, they, the, the, the exponential growth of these guys they, they, they replicate each other. And I mean, in Dyson's thing, he also had cell division. So the reason I get a little bit confused is, remember, he had a bag, and he said, every so often the bag divides, right? And then, of course, there's, and then it continues, right, in the bag. And we don't actually have a bag, but you could just as well put these in a bag, right, and start dividing the bag, in which case you would have entities which were basically organisms filled with this metabolism, and that's what would be propagated down the line. I think with great fidelity, because it's the fastest growing mode. Well, so I think. And, and, you, and you replicate more precisely. Yeah, so I. He said, first is metabolism. Right, then but, but Paul, so I think that that, so I, if I understand correctly, I think that that is in here in the following sense. If you start out yeah. this reaction with, you know, a, the n equals 7 chiral cluster, yeah. right, and you start forming octahedra, and then you start dividing the cells, at the beginning, the cells that you're dividing are going to have all of this crap in it. There's going to be parts of, right, there's going to be parts of all of this stuff, right? There's going to be all this other crap in it. Right? But then what's going to happen is as it continues, there's a fastest growing mode. Right? There is a fastest growing mode. And so eventually what's going to happen, as long as you have some way of disposing of the old ones, is that it is going to get taken over with the fastest growing mode, which was going to be pure, which will be that or whatever. Right? So you will just have these bags with those in it. So in that sense, I think this is in here because you don't start out with the fastest growing mode. You start out with whatever you put in there at the beginning. You form lots of crap. Then out comes the fastest growing mode. You can't choose what it is, but then... Yeah, he might have. So we have no. So I'd love to talk about this and understand this. We we don't we don't allow the matrix to change. We start out with the way we played this game. I see. Yeah, I see. 
Okay. Uh, are there other questions? No, no, that's a question. Uh, I mean, so is there any reason why this either would or wouldn't be compatible with the sort of dominant way people think about right now as to what happened in the IRA? Um, it gets me, I get very nervous speculating about reality. <laughs> Well, no, but but it, but but in the in the RNA world, though, you, you, you yeah, there's catal yeah. I mean, okay. So let me try to answer this differently. Let me try this. So, that, so I think it might be. I, I I don't see the difference quite, and I actually think you know as a purely theoretical problem, I'm very interested in the RNA version of this. Actually, I think it's I've gotten very into. I mean, I, this is probably totally nuts, and you should yell at me and tell me don't go down that road. But I mean, there are lots of technical challenges with doing this sort of thing with RNA, like. Well, which we could talk about, but you know, it, it, I think it's interesting, and it, it <coughs> maybe I don't. Others. Okay. Thank you.